And we want to take you to Tallahassee right now where Governor Ron DeSantis is doing a briefing. Let's listen into what he has to say. Other underlying medical conditions. And so with that knowledge, uh, both the federal government with the CMS guidelines, as well as the state of Florida uh, with the guidelines put out by our ACA secretary, um, have been very clear uh, about the need for people who are operating nursing homes and assisted living facilities um, to protect their residents. Um, nevertheless, there are now two confirmed deaths from the same uh, ALF in Broward County, uh, Altria Wildwood. Uh, they got 96 on the ALF side, 123 on the independent side. Um, there are seven positive cases uh, total. Two of the positives are deceased. Uh, five positives are from the ALF side and two positives are from the independent side. Six more tests are pending. What the investigation has found out is that construction workers, staff, and cooks who were ill uh, were not screened uh, and were allowed to go uh, work their jobs and mix with the residents uh, unimpeded. Uh, that is exactly what you are not supposed to do. Uh, and so law enforcement will be there to help monitor the situation. We've requested the CDC to embed an infection control specialist on site. Um, I have now, ACA has a embedded staff at the facility around the clock. Um, but if you are an operator of one of these facilities, uh, you need to take responsibility to protect your residents. Um, this is a virus that is in certain communities spreading in Florida, and Broward is one of them. Um, and you need to take action to protect your people. On a better note, I'm happy to report that yesterday we announced uh, the launching of a drive-through test uh, site in Broward County uh, in conjunction with Memorial Healthcare and the Florida National Guard. Uh, and I was very um, uh, measured about what to expect because most of these sites that, that try to launch don't end up working out and there's some major problems. So I told everyone, be patient, we're gonna to try to get it right, um, but I'm happy to report as of four o'clock, uh, the initial goal I think was to do about 250 samples collected. They've already collected 407 samples uh, in this one test site on their first day. Uh, this is in CB Smith Park, 900 North Flamingo Road, Pembroke Pines, Florida. Um, and really the only thing you can do is go into the main gate um, hours of operation 9 a.m. to 5, Monday through Sunday, uh, started uh, uh, today, Friday, March 20th. Um, the test results, is, as many of you know, there's backlogs with the private labs. Uh, Memorial Health's lab is almost online, uh, but we're obviously, we'd love to turn those test results as soon as possible. Uh, but this is something where they go in, they get screened. If they pass the initial screening, they go to step two. Um, they fill out the registration and lab form. There's a collection. Um, then they get, then they leave in their car and Broward Memorial will run the lab and inform the individual of the results. And so um, we would like to scale this up and hopefully replicate it uh, around the state because I really think that the number one thing that we need is just a lot more people to have been tested. If we had that, then I think we would be able uh, to make some, some, some more informed choices. Um, the federal government, thank you, uh, Mr. President, has sent three packs basically ready-made test sites. Uh, the one in Jacksonville is, is here, ready to go. Uh, there's about 2,500 swabs, and um, that is not going to be run by the federal government. I think it's going to be run by local folks in Jacksonville, and that is supposed to open tomorrow. Um, and then Jared and I have helped with um, uh, Baptist in uh, Jacksonville. Uh, we provided swabs so that they, they're doing some drive-through testing as well. So I think you're starting to see real movement on this, which is, which is exciting. Uh, and then the, we're working on a launch at the Villages, um, big drive-through testing site, um, only at the Villages, they're not going to be driving their automobiles, they're going to be driving their golf carts through. Um, but we think that having some high volume testing there, especially given the demographics, would be very, very good. Uh, so expanding testing continues to be one of the highest priorities uh, of our response, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, I put out a number of different executive orders today. Uh, one of the ones involved uh, restaurant service in, in Florida. 
Uh, we had restricted that initially statewide, but did allow limited sit-in as long as they were spaced out uh, enough so that someone couldn't infect someone else. Um, and the thought was that, you know, maybe they get a little more business and can stay afloat. And then sometimes families just need a place to go. The vast majority of restaurants did it. They abided by the restrictions. Some didn't. And it's just the type of thing that, you know, we don't have time to police that. So we're going to take out and delivery only, um, which is, you know, somewhat unfortunate because it's going to be hard for some of these restaurants to survive in this in environment. But one way I think we can help them is I have waived um, applicable regulations and we will allow the restaurants to deliver with meals uh, alcohol deliveries as well. Um, and then because we uh, stopped the bars on St. Patrick's Day, a lot of people had bought a lot of um, you know good stuff for that night. Um, we're actually waiving regulations to allow them to sell it back uh, because the retail, there's actually big demand for this. And so you know some of these small businesses were able to do that. Heck, they may even get a premium on it because it's such in demand. So we're trying to help as best we can, but we've got to do um, what is um, what is safe for everybody. Uh, we also issued an executive order uh, stopping elective and unnecessary surgeries. Part of this is you don't want those elected surgeries to take too much space in the hospital. Um, you want, if there's a surge, to have more, more beds available. But actually, the more we looked at it, much more than even that was just the personal protective equipment. This is in such short supply that we need to make sure all our healthcare providers are, are saving their PPE and using them for potential COVID-19 patients. And so that executive order goes into effect immediately. Also signed an executive order to waive in-person meeting requirements to ensure public officials can safely continue their duties without impediment. I'm also working on a plan, as, as many of you know, we did the uh, virtual semester for the universities. Uh, and the hope is, is that the students would actually go back to their homes and, and do it from there. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of them were at the universities going to bars. So then we closed the bars and then they started going to fraternity houses and doing that. So we would want them to go back. They're gonna take um, uh, classes uh, virtually. Some of the people who, um, you know, do that will have refunds or credits due if they haven't used their food service payments or, or their, their, their room. So we're going to work on refunding that. Um, given that they're doing remote learning, they really don't need to be paying room and board. So hopefully we'll be able to get that done through the Board of Governors. I'm also happy to report that the first small business bridge loans have been approved by the Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, we had uh, Full Press Apparel and Jersey Mike Subs, uh, small business owners uh, both uh, for both of those in Tallahassee. And so they're relieving loans in a very quick three-day review process after the loan program was activated on Monday. Um, and for government work, it doesn't get any quicker than that. So I want to thank Ken Lawson uh, for what he's doing. Uh, we're also working hard on reemployment assistance. We know it's going to be tough for a lot of people. Some people have asked about our numbers. The Department of Labor waits until the week's over to put it out. So Ken will do that. But I can tell you, obviously, if you go back two weeks, you saw a spike, loss, you know, increase last week, and then an even bigger spike this week. And and you you can understand why that would be the case. Um, but I've directed Ken to no longer require a claimant to register with the state job search portal to actively seek employment. Obviously, we're in a situation where um, you know, it's going to be tough before this dust settles. Um, and then we're also uh, going to waive penalties to employers for any type of registration um, with the system. And um, right now, there's kind of a perverse incentive an employer may have um, to keep an employee on the payroll, but would dramatically reduce or deferred hours, uh, therefore preventing them from seeking unemployment assistance. And so, you know, we want to just remove any type of um, uh, unintentional gamesmanship. And then finally, um, you know, some of the work requirements, which I think generally are a great idea and I'm supportive of in this environment, you know, we'd rather just get the, get the relief to people. So we're going to be waiving that as well. The Department of Health has over 700 school nurses ready to help with the COVID-19 response. They're DOH employees. They can be de uh, deployed in their community since school is out. And uh, we really appreciate um, all that they're doing. So we have had close to now, uh, as we sit here today, 
a little under 9,000 uh, tests that have been conducted between the DOH labs and the private laboratories. So that is a pretty steep increase, and we obviously want to continue to scale that up. Um, the latest numbers, so we have a total of 520 cases, 474 Florida residents. There will be an update later tonight that will probably obviously have more. Broward and Miami-Dade continues to be the hot spot. You have 124 total in Broward, 113 total in Miami-Dade. You do have some in, in other parts of the state, but I think the way we look at it is, you know, if we're able to get all these testing supplies where they needed to go, and you have a county that has five, ten positives, you know, we have an opportunity doing these investigations to isolate, trace the contacts, test, 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 um, kind of a South Korea model. Um, and so that, that's the good news. The bad news with Broward and Dade is it's spreading throughout the community. Um, so if you do that, that would still help, but it's not going to solve the entire problem. Um, in Broward, of the 124 total cases, 57 have documented to be travel related and 52 have been a known contact with a COVID patient. Uh, and so you look, I mean, that's, um, you know, you still have, um, you know, a dozen, 20, you know, in that, that range who we have, they're totally unlinked. And so the unlinked cases are obviously uh, what you see when you have community spread. Miami-Dade of the 113, 44 travel related and 30 with a known contact of COVID-19. So again, you know, you have, uh, you know, a majority that where you can trace, but then you have, you know, some of these other cases. And so uh, we're tracking all of this. Uh, we have 1,028 pending test results. And then based on what's happening today, you know, that number is going to continue to grow. Um, so I think there's a lot of progress being made. But look, there's a, I think a lot of people just, um, it's a very difficult time for folks. Um, if you look at, you know, you have California and New York doing things that really are extraordinary and things that we haven't seen, you know, in this country in a long time. People don't know what's around the corner. They don't um, really understand what this virus can mean. Um, and the thing I want to say is, you know, this is not going to be easy, uh, but we will get through it. Uh, we're going to work hard together as a community, and uh, we're going to come out of this on the other side uh, stronger than we are now. Um, I can tell you, people around the state are working incredibly hard um, on the response. Um, you know, if you look at what our healthcare uh, professionals are doing, um, you know, this is the equivalent of, um, you know, the Navy SEALs going to go to Ab Abbottabad and getting bin Laden. It's, it's, this is the big time, all hands on deck. They are working selflessly and tirelessly. So are our first responders. A lot of folks at the local level and our local governments have been doing a great job. Folks up here on this team have been doing well. Um, and then the federal government, uh, the president, the vice president, and their uh, task force, um, uh, they are working around the clock as well. So I just want to thank everyone for their efforts um, and just let Floridians know that we're in it together. Uh, we're going to get through it. Um, it's not going to be easy in the, in, the, in the days and weeks to come, but, but we will get through it, and, um, and, and we'll be there for you. And with that, I'll take some questions. Governor, I have a question. Um, we've been hearing from some of the law enforcement in the south part of the state, and they're concerned that people aren't following quarantine measures because they're voluntary quarantines, and they're asking why you guys haven't instituted mandatory quarantines for some of these COVID patients. Um, well, actually, that would be oh, so the so the people that are self isolating. Yeah. Well, that'd be a question for the Surgeon General. Um, you want to address that in mandatory quarantine? Yeah, it's it's absolutely essential if somebody has COVID nineteen that they have to self isolate. And if we become aware of an individual who is out and about is not staying home, we will issue a quarantine. Thank you. They don't have the teeth right now because it's a voluntary quarantine. So what I can say is. Um, so we had um, the guy who got on the JetBlue flight from New York who tested positive, and he gets on the flight. JetBlue banned him for life, which I think was, was, was good. Um, he lands, and then he wasn't going to self-isolate. And so I told the sheriff, uh, Dr. Rivkes, as a Surgeon General in a public health emergency, he can issue a quarantine order. Uh, we're willing to do that. Um, and so law enforcement has people um, who are uh, supposed to self-isolate, particularly those who are infected. Um, you know, let us know, um, and, and we'll give you the tools to be able to enforce um, an order like that. I mean, you know, uh, for a guy to get on a plane like that and then want to go out in the community afterwards, I mean, come on, you gotta, you got to do a better job than that. Governor, 
Right, we're getting a lot of calls from people who work in large retail establishments that want to wear protective masks or protective gloves as they deal with customers who they say are coughing and sneezing, yet their employers are telling them that they can't do that because they don't want to scare the customers. Do you want to weigh in on that? Look, I think people should be able to protect themselves. I mean, if you look what South Korea did, they did not do a shutdown the way, you know, we've kind of done in the United States. What they did was they protected the folks who were most vulnerable. They tested, 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 but then they protected themselves. So you'd actually have people wearing the masks when they go to work and doing things like that. And, um, you know, I just think employee safety is, is paramount. Um, I think we're in a situation now, you know, if this were a month ago or, or a year ago and you had a mask, people would be like, what are, you, what are you doing maybe? But I think people understand the environment we're in. And, um, you know, I would just say pe keep people safe. That was one of, I mean, I think that that's, obviously you've seen some businesses take a hit, but we still have a lot of employees out there and, um, and I know a lot of them in a variety of, variety of industries have concerns. And so um, I would just say safety is important. And it's, it's really the smart business decision because if you have a, an employee that gets infected, then you got to isolate other people. It's not going to be good for your business either. And speaking of masks, we have, um, so by March 25th, we'll have a million and 25 masks. March 28th, another million. And then I think by the first week of April, we'll have a total of 5 million N95 masks that the state will have. We obviously want to push that out to our health care providers and personnel. But that, the mask issue, the PPE, the gowns, there's a major shortage of this stuff around the country. We're glad we got the mask. That was the, what 3M has done to spin that off. If we can get some more PPE for our healthcare workers, you know that will be very, very important. Um, you know they're going at it every day, putting themselves uh, at risk um, w with this, and um, you know that's not a that's not an easy feeling. I mean, some of the other things they could be exposed to. You know, there's w they know about it and they can kind of treat. We, we don't know about this. There's no there's no vaccine. We don't have an antiviral. Um, we're hoping we get some stuff. Um, so so we appreciate what they're doing. Um, you mentioned uh, before about uh, you know being aware that people aren't going to just stay shut in for, for forever, and they're, after a while they'll they'll um, you know start to get um, just just too tired of this. How essential is the, the testing part of it then to to have that done in a quick and, and timely yeah, way? Well, it's, so it's huge. Is there a threat there's going to be another curve if if we don't get right? Done so so doing this stuff is there's a limited duration that the society is going to be able to do it. I mean, that's just the reality. How long? Maybe people could disagree. Um, one of the reasons why I've tried to say that, you know, you need to practice the social distancing, but you, you don't have to necessarily just shut in 24 hours a day um, is because I think that that's a more sustainable model. And the more people are shut in, I think the more anxious they get. You know, at the villages, um, and obviously that's a demographic that, that is threatened by this, the tee sheets are filled on the golf course. But what they're doing is they wipe down the cart. Only one person sits in the cart. They don't shake hands with who they're playing with. They don't touch the flag stick. So they practice social distancing in every aspect of that, but are at least able to get out, you know, have fun by abiding by all these restrictions. And so they're not going to get sick if they follow those guidelines. Um, and I think that is a more sustainable model if people have the ability to do some things in a safe way. Um, so that all being said, the more you test, the less restrictive some of these things are going to need to be on society. Uh, South Korea never did a lockdown because they did over 200,000 tests. They understood where the virus had gone, and they were able to contain it uh, amongst a pretty de large group of people. We just don't, we had not had the data to do that. I mean, we were in a situation, the virus was here. Initially, people were only allowed to get tested if they had been to China or had been something like that. Um, that is obviously broadened. And as we get more supplies and continue to do that, we're going to be able to broaden it even more. And that's going to be a huge, huge help um, in terms of doing this. And then any of these mitigation measures you're doing will be more targeted and I think, you know, kind of less harmful for society. But I, there's a lot of angst. I mean, you think about, you know, the kids are not in school. Uh, and then parents are going to work or doing this or doing that, then some, maybe a parent loses a job. There's just a lot of angst out there. And so if we can do this in a way that, that, that gives people a little bit of relief and outlet, 
it, within the confines of being safe, I think we're better for it. Yes. Um, kind of piggyback on, on Gray's question. Um, I've been speaking to some legal experts, and they're saying that you're kind of in a position where you're balancing Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment rights with obviously the need to protect the public. Um, how much of that actually goes into your strategy as you're trying to? You've been actually much more light-handed than other states have with sweeping mandates, like uh, like Ohio and Illinois and Indiana. Well, part of that though is 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 because I want to do things that will be followed and that will be effective. And if you and if you go too hard, then I think people lose confidence and they rebel against it. So we've tried to have a collaborative approach, um, not because I don't think I have the power. Uh, governors have in these situations some some serious police powers. Um, I'm not somebody that likes necessarily wielding that. I want I don't really I don't want to tell anyone what to do. That's my nature. But in this situation, you know, you got to do it. So we've we've laid down um, some some mandates. Uh, we have tried to do it as collaboratively as possible because at the end of the day, I can issue a mandate, but if the local community's folks don't want to enforce it, then it's toothless. Um, if the local uh, electeds are saying we can't have this, then the people aren't going to have confidence in it. So if we're all on the same page, we're all in it together, we have a chance to, to, make, to make progress. So that's just, I think, the nature of it. But it's not because of power or not power. A lot of what these governors are doing Traditionally in American history, in these situations, you know, they do wield a power that the federal government does not possess under a limited constitution. The states have that residual power. Go back to the, the testing. Is there um, a goal of a, a certain amount of tests to get done each day or a certain amount by a certain uh, deadline? I know you mentioned 625,000, but it doesn't sound like the. So we have, the we have the test, we have yeah. enough test kits that would lead to that. We don't have enough collection swabs to lead to that. Jared has, we have an order that, that, that we that was supposed to be filled for half a million swabs. Obviously, the federal government's sending stuff, which is great. Some of the hospitals are getting them too. But if, I, if we get those swabs in, we would push those all out, and we would try to ratchet it up as quickly as possible. Um, it's just a matter. We've been getting it in dribs and drabs. So we, want, we thought we were going to get half of it this week. Instead, we got about, what, 6,500 or 5,000, 10,000, which is helpful. But man, if I could get more of those swabs, um, you know, we could start running through people. And I've said this before, but we could also then launch um, diagnostic pro uh, sentinel programs where we just want, hey, if you're age 25 to 35 and you may have had a sniffle, just come through and we'll try to see how this is in that segment of society and try to get some information and some data on that. And then we could be able to use that. I mean, we really don't know. I mean, for example, you know, I have two young kids. I think it's clear that a kid can get it like a, like a, a small child. It's not clear whether the kid can transmit it or not or how contagious they are or anything like that. Um, but that's kind of an important thing to know, especially if the kids, you know, when, whenever they go back to school. So, yeah, the, the, the testing capacity, I think, would, would allow us to really – um, you know, defeat this um, in a way that, that we, without it, it's just going to be much more difficult. I have a question for Secretary Mayhew. Sure. Uh, you would mentioned earlier this week that you uh, wouldn't discuss specific facilities, but if there were an assisted living facility that where five residents had tested positive, what would be the protocol for testing the rest of the staff and the rest of the residents? I'm really going to defer, actually, to the Surgeon General because this really falls under the Department of Health. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. When we become aware of this, we will send in a strike team. And this strike team will consist of a nurse, an epidemiologist, an infection control specialist, and somebody from ACA. And we will go door to door. We actually did this earlier this week. And we checked every resident for their temperature. We made sure that these individuals were well, made sure that they were isolated, made sure that the facility had proper decontamination and cleaning protocols in place. And then if we found a resident who was actually ill, we would make sure that person would have medical attention. I can't emphasize enough that we have to keep COVID out of these facilities. We have to make sure that workers going in there are screened. We need to make sure the contractors going there are, sc are screened. And we actually have a command center where uh, if a, f a facility has concern, they can call it up. It's manned 24 hours a day, and we will send in teams. Thank you. Also, just, you know, I haven't really addressed, addressed it yet, but just, you know, you see some of the reporting that's come out about the origination of this virus and um, the actions of the Chinese government to, um, to try to cover it up, obfuscate, 
and, and not do the types of things that could have been done to save the world from having to face it. And um, I can tell you that, that given their actions and given what has happened here and will continue to happen, hopefully not too much longer, um, that their, their view, how Americans view them, will never be the same. They've never been terribly popular as a country here. Um, but I think that uh, you know, we have got to hold China accountable. We've got to look at how we're making things. Uh, you know, we can't have a hostile country be dependent on a hostile country for key things uh, that we may need in an emergency. And uh, I just think that you're going to see a sea change in how China is discussed um, in American politics, and rightfully so. Governor, do you think that some of the comments that are being made by some members of Congress, especially in, in the Florida delegation, are, are kind of hindering the efforts in terms of like stirring up the masses and the claims of why didn't you shut down all the beaches or shut down this or that. I mean, how, is that? I wouldn't know because I haven't followed any of the stuff they do. People are going to chirp. That's just the way the politicians are. You know, we've been working day and night on this. Um, I think that this is more challenging than a hurricane in terms of all the things going on. And so we're just going to keep going. Uh, we did everything we've done has been in consultation with all the local governments on all these issues. Um, and we're trying to strike the right balance and getting the, the, the right policies for, for, for sometimes different policies for different parts of the state, just given the different challenges that you're facing. Um, and we've been willing to work with people, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. I mean, the first test site, you know, we launched but the National Guard is in the most democratic county in Florida, in Broward, um, because we're there to serve. You know, we're not there to play politics. And so I wouldn't expect very much more from members of Congress, quite frankly. But, um, you know, I'm going to let them chirp and, and I'm going to work. One last question. Uh, there's been a, a couple of uh, requests from, from different lawmakers to extend deadlines on, on different things, um, basically well, a moratorium on evictions, um, certain uh, payments. Uh, there, uh, I think quarterly corporate income tax payments are due at the end of the month. Um, have you heard any of that? Have those requests gotten to you and any any more of that? Coming I think I, I, I don't know specifically what requests we see, but I would say that uh, we're interested in looking at um, any action we can take that will get us through this hopefully short term but but difficult period. And we understand uh, uh, how you know government policy at the federal, state, and local level um, have have caused uh, you know some of the business interruption here. And uh, whether that's an individual worker or business, uh, I think we have to look at look at everything we can to uh, to, to make it as smooth uh, as smooth as possible to get on the other side of this. I think we can come back really strong. I think we've got a lot of great things going on in this state. Um, but, uh, but this is not something that's just going to happen overnight. It's going to require a lot of hard work. And so if folks are, are, uh, are negatively impacted, you know, I think the least we can do is look to see the lay of the land, how we can help. Now, we have done a bunch of stuff already, um, but, but if there's more to do, I'm, I'm interested in helping. Thanks.